Happy Canada Day, everybody, and welcome to the 700 Club Canada. I'm Laurel and Tyler Thompson, and we have got a very exciting program planned for you today, featuring one of Canada's most respected Christian leaders of the last 30 years, former head of the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada, president of Tyndale University College and Seminary, and current global ambassador for the World Evangelical Alliance, Brian Stiller, joins us today. And the rest of this week as well, to take a good hard look with us at the state of Christianity and the church in Canada today. I'll also hit the streets to find out your favorite and least favorite things about being Canadian. But first, here's Brian with Brian. Thank you, Laura Lynn. You know, today we have one of the privileges of having a jewel in Canada, Dr. Brian Stiller, but more importantly, my friend and just a wonderful man. Welcome to the 700 Club Canada. Thanks, Brian. You know, when I look at your, your past and I look at some of the things that you've been able to accomplish by the grace of God, did you have any idea that God was going to do some of the things in your life that he's done? You're always surprised uh, on one hand. And the second, when you look back at your life, you aren't, that, you aren't that impressed with what you've done. So, so you, the one uh, moderates the other. Mm -hmm. uh, I was born in the prairies of Canada. Yeah. I'm a prairie boy. Yeah. My father was a Pentecostal minister and he was a bishop or a superintendent of a, of a, of a province, churches in a province. Yeah. And I loved our community. Uh, I loved our summer camp. Uh, I loved our event. Saskatoon. Saskatoon. <laughs> Saskatoon berries, which That's you eat right. the best fruit in the world. <laughs> and we had this camp out on Manitou Lake. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you got to get a picture of this. Yeah. Manitou Lake is almost as salty as the Dead Sea. Oh, my. Now, tell me, who in the world would build a camp on the edge of a saltwater lake and call it Living Waters Camp? <laughs> except Pentecostals. <laughs> and that was the world in which I was raised. Yes. <laughs> and, and I loved hearing, when I was a kid, I loved going to camp because I would hear three sermons a day. And I loved sermons. I loved to hear preachers preach. And mm. I wanted to figure out why they did and how they did it. So that, as a, as a boy, that early became my sense of calling. Mm -hmm. And so the opportunities that have come over the, the last, uh, you know, 60 years, uh, 60, 55 years, uh, it really has emerged out of that experience. And so you're surprised when the Lord leads you this way rather than that way. Yes. I, I must say disappointed. Yes. So my life has been filled with disappointments. Mm. In that, what I wanted to do, I didn't end up doing. And what was that? I knew you were going to ask that question. <laughs> you see, on the top level of the food chain of our ministry mm -hmm. as a kid, we're preachers. Sure. Like, for me, nothing was as important as a preacher. They were the rock stars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember Nicholas Bengu came from South Africa, mm -hmm. the first black man I had ever seen. And I was about 12 years of age sitting in Elam Tabernacle one Sunday night and this South African got up to preach. I had never heard preaching that way in my life. I didn't know anybody but could preach that way. I didn't know that sermons could be delivered that way. Hmm. It was a powerful moment. So Nicholas Bangu, along with others, established preaching as the top level of, of life. Yeah. And I wanted to be a great preacher. Wow. Now, who were the preachers of the day at that time when, when you were coming up? And before you answer that question, let me ask you a question. How did the fire really go on? Because, I mean, you were, you were brought up in a Christian family, but when did you know that Christ had captured your heart and the Holy Spirit was alive in you? Well, you know, I've been born again a few times. <laughs> <laughs> born uh, again, again, again. Yeah, I get it again. Uh, b because... One's spiritual life is, a, is an evolving, progressive, and an up and down experience. Mm. So when I was a boy, I remember confessing Christ. Yeah. Uh, I can never remember not loving Jesus. Mm. I can never remember not. But I remember in early high school, I got into real trouble in my own heart. And Bernice Gerard came to town, Saskatoon, uh -huh. and she preached, and that night, I remember going, my buddy and I, 
we went down to the washroom afterwards, and I took out, we smoked black cat court cigarettes. I mean, that was the only <laughs> kind that men smoked, yeah. okay? And I remember taking them out Unfiltered. of my pocket, and I'm breaking them into the toilet and drop and flushing them down the toilet, wow. and I said to my buddy, Lauren, Lauren, it's over for me. i got to follow Jesus. Mm. So that was about 14 or 15, and my life was changed. Mm -hmm. that, was the, that was the moment when the light really came on. When you look back, and, and uh, yourself and Lily have celebrated 50 years. Yes. Um, when did that happen? Well, we met at college. Okay. Uh, actually, my dad was president of the school, Central Pentecostal College in Saskatoon. Uh, Lily was hired to teach music, and she came into first year class as well. So we met. Uh, my buddy Terry Law and I, we put together a, a male quartet, and we got Lily to rehearse with us, and then Ooh. she traveled with us. So, so there, was, there was a plan with this. <laughs> oh, man. It, well, somebody was working it out. Yeah. And so at the end of the three, three years, of we both graduated together. We were married that fall, in the fall of 63. And then your first charge, where you began to really say, I want to be this great preacher. I've heard this South African. When did you actually get into the, uh, the saddle yourself? I tried, but I failed. Came to, moved to the University of Toronto, uh, graduated in 66, and for a year, my wife and I traveled doing evangelistic work, as we did back in the 60s. Mm. I was a disaster. <laughs> yeah, I was. That's hard to believe. Well, I was too academic. Yes. And remember, it was the time of the Nikki Cruz days. Yes. And, and I had no... I Crossing had, the switchblade. Yeah, and I had no scars to show. Yeah. You know, Lily was the only one I had slept with. I had never taken drugs. I hadn't drunk. Yeah. So I had, I had no story of conversion. Mm. And I just spent six years in college and university, and I was too cerebral. <sighs> and I came out, and I tried this evangelistic thing, and I just was a failure. Mm. At the end of that time, as I was languishing just outside of Winnipeg in a town called Steinbeck, Manitoba. I know it well. I got a call from Youth for Christ in Montreal. But I knew that if I was going to take that, which was an organizational leadership role, yeah. this dream I had had of being a great preacher mm -hmm. was on hold. Okay. And that changed my life. Mm. And I moved from the aspirations that had come out of my boyhood and the disappointments that that was to was that that was over my life yes i came to realize my primary gifting mm. and out of that i experienced the joy of being obedient to the call of the lord when i finally understood that i was living a bit of a dream that wasn't didn't corroborate with reality mm. and the reality touch which which came in my vocational life god enabled me then to move on and to provide leadership through a number of organizations. Beautiful. We're going to talk a little bit more about that because I know there's a lot of people dealing with disappointment, finding broken, uh, find a broken wall, seven ancient principles for the 21st century leaders. It's one of the new projects that you're, you're putting out. But I, I know you've struck a chord that there are a number of people that are thinking about, wow, um, I've got disappointment. I had this intent, and now God has this. I've learned over time, especially pastoring and ministry, the same road that we run away from God is usually the same road that God has his arms open wide to receive us. So our disappointment can be actually our appointment. Could you pray with someone and look at someone and just ask God to uh, give them a, uh, an understanding of their call? Dear Father, in this moment, as I offer this prayer for that person who struggles with disappointment, help them to know that, as Brian has just said, a disappointment becomes an appointment. And failure can become the greatest moment of learning about self and about what we can do. So for my friend who is uh, in that moment, may they turn to you and know that you're their biggest fan that you love them, and that you want them to become what you've always intended them to become. I offer this prayer because you love us, and you're the strong one. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, God has a great plan for you, and you're going to be uh, in for a wonderful ride. Dr. Stiller is going to be here with us all week, so don't go away. We'll be right back.
great interview. You know, when I was uh, listing off all the qualifications of Brian Stiller, I thought that my tongue was going to get tied up in all of that. And you wonder about these people that are so accomplished and have so much. In fact, in the Word of God, Paul the Apostle was an extremely accomplished man highly trained. He was a Pharisee. When you're a Pharisee, you had to memorize tons and tons of scripture and be able to recite it. And uh, you had to live by the letter of the law. And in Philippians 3, Paul, very accomplished, had something to say about a life spent in service to Jesus. He said, put no confidence in the flesh. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. And he went on to list all of his qualifications. If you have any insecurity today, if you think, you know, I'm not like Brian Warren, I'm not like Brian Stiller, I don't have all of that stuff going on, I, I barely understand the word when I read it sometimes. I want you to know something, that God has a destiny and a plan for you. And it's really cool the way Paul goes on to say, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, Paul says, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. Christ. You know, at the end of the day, it's so simple. It's about trusting Jesus with your whole life. He will take everything that you have and make something incredible out of it. Amen. Laura Lynn, you're so right. In the end of that verse, it says also that, um, that Jesus himself, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Mm -hmm. You know, you may be on this Canada Day saying, but what am I leaving behind? What kind of legacy will I have? Will it be like Brian Stiller? Will it be like Laura Lynn or anyone else? Well, you can, if you start today, leave a legacy. Mm -hmm. And I believe that God is gonna do something. I wanna put something into your hands. Is it real, will it last? And all I want you to do is put God first. On July 1st, put God first. Pray this prayer. Father, I'm not willing to give you all of me, but I'm willing to be made willing. This day, I open up my heart and give you my personal permission for your heavenly intervention. God, I will live for you. You have dominion over my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, would you give us a call at 1-855-759-0700? Your legacy starts today. I guess what I would love best about Canada is the freedom that we have in this beautiful country to live, speak our minds, practice our spiritual beliefs with a sense of being blessed. Mm -hmm. We live in such a free country. Do you think some people take that for granted? It's easy to take it for granted when you get caught up in the day to day. Um, but that's the good thing about Canada Day. <clears throat> it's a time to reflect on what we're most grateful mm -hmm. for. Yeah, we're yes. pretty blessed. Very blessed. Yeah. Welcome back, everybody. Well, this is my brother, Brian, and this is my other brother, Brian. <laughs> and I have enjoyed uh, listening to you both. I know that you have a relationship that goes way back, mm -hmm. and it's a beautiful relationship. And you, both of you understand uh, sort of Christianity and the history in Canada. And I'm wondering, uh, Brian, if you could tell us about the state of Christianity in Canada today and how you have seen that evolve. Well, you know, there are, there are multi-sides, of course, to that. To, that's a complex question. Yeah. Uh, but there are a, a few uh, influences and directions that our country has taken with respect to faith. Uh, today, I think there is, there's a vibrancy here that surprises me. So that's the good story. There is a longer-term sad story that has greatly altered the Canadian landscape. And there were two factors in the, in the, in the, the 20th century that altered it. Uh, the first was in 1925, the United Church was formed. And the United Church was formed out of the uh, Methodists or the Wesleyans, uh, 
75% of the Presbyterians and all the Congregationalists. And in the early part of the 20th century, there was a great interest in, in the gospel speaking to the social needs of people. And these three denominations that formed the United Church, it eventually took that from the 1925 up until today, it has taken a major section of the Protestant community and has moved it from a, from a more of an evangelical, conservative, uh, biblical base uh, and influenced by German rationalism and higher criticism and the social gospel, it defined itself uh, under the, the ages and the, the writings of uh, uh, Rausenbusch, who was an American Baptist. He defined the gospel as being the social gospel and essentially saying the real issue of salvation is not Brian, you, the sinner, to be saved. Mm -hmm. The real problem with you being not a good person is the social categories that are influencing you and making you a bad person. So the gospel has got to come in and change housing, got to change jobs, got to change labor, all those things. And if we can improve society, then you'll be improved. Yeah. And as a result, the church over the, over the 20th century moved from a place of evangelism to a place of social action. Now, mm -hmm. in many ways, that was a good, good thing. But what it did over the 20th century and today, we have those groups of people that are a very small percentage of the Canadian society. And when that church loses its moral leverage to influence the country, we all are affected. The second wave was the Roman Catholic Church. Now, traditionally, Canada is made up of 47% are Catholics. So Canada, by any statistical evaluation, is a Catholic country. But focused in Quebec, in the 60s, the Quiet Revolution brought about secularization in Quebec to the place that the church today is really a, just a very a shadow of, of, of its former self. And so her ability to influence Quebec, uh, interesting, in the 1960s, Quebec had the highest birth rate of any Caucasian civilization known in history. Wow. In the 1980s, Quebec had the lowest birth rate of any uh, Caucasian civilization in, in history in 20 years. Mm -hmm. So it, it shows that birth control and abortion became the, the Catholic Church lost her ability to influence. So you've got these two major Christian bodies, the Catholic Church and the United, and the United Church making up those three bodies, losing their influence and presence and their numbers uh, in, our, in our country. And when that happens, then the culture can take a whole shift and the, the Christian influence has been diminished. Mm -hmm. So that's one side of the story. Yeah. And so with the void that you're talking about really diminishing their influence and, and going more to a social gospel, because what we're talking about is looking at it anthropologically, where you start to study the culture and you believe if you can change the culture, you can change the man. But instead of the understanding in when Wesley and uh, when John Wesley and, and the Wesley movement came in, it is you need to repent of your sin. Yeah. So has sin actually disappeared as well? from the dialogue of the church, the modern church in Canada? Uh, the, the, in my experience, the, the, the broader Protestant church has lost her edge of talking about the sinfulness of the person and their need for conversion and transformation. Mm. That language is hardly heard. The, the language that you hear about is more, we need to change the social categories, improve housing, improve labor, improve uh, uh, the, the access to whatever uh, service a woman needs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what, what happened in the, towards the two-thirds of the way through the, the, the 20th century, the evangelical Protestant community all of a sudden realized they had made a mistake. Mm. They had something to learn from the United Church that indeed God does care about those social categories. He does care about unemployment. He does right. care about health care, all those kinds. He does care about the environment. So evangelicals recognized they needed to broaden their sense of the gospel. The gospel mm -hmm. isn't just about the individual getting saved and ready for heaven. Yes, that's important. We aren't going to lose that emphasis. But also, the society in which the person lives, God also cares about that because the society does influence our children and our grandchildren. And if God doesn't salt and light, the metaphors Jesus used, if salt and light isn't there, if salt is absent, decay prevails. Yeah. If, if light is absent, darkness prevails. And we realize that politics, medicine, education, all of these things in life matter to the Lord. And evangelicals became engaged in a new way. 
And we learned there was a, a wonderful line from a, from a, a, a prime minister of Netherlands 100 years ago, a, Abraham Kuyper. He had this one line. He said, there's not one square inch of creation that God doesn't say, that's mine. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all they that dwell therein. And we've come to realize that. And over the last 25, 30 years, there's been a revitalization uh, within the evangelical Protestant community. But also there was a larger history in the 20th century called the Pentecostal movement that morphed into the charismatic movement. And uh, there's a more detailed story about that. But what happened when the charismatic movement finally opened its doors the spirit rushed in, mm -hmm. and that has been transformative of all Christian communities mm -hmm. over the over the last uh, forty years. Dr. Stiller, you are really touching on a lot of things, but I, I think something that just keeps resounding is the salt and light. And if the salt loses its savior, it's good for nothing. And it was kind of a play on words that I was saying that it's savior, <laughs> not yeah. just yeah. it's savior, right? Um, as we close out, I know there are. Our mothers, fathers, grandmothers, grandfathers, theologians, and, and them, they're saying, wow, I need to get the salt back. Especially for the younger generation. Yeah. What's the answer? Presence. Allowing Christ to, to, to live in your life and walking into that business Monday morning, Wednesday morning, and as you walk down the halls of your office or the school or wherever you are, to look at that world around you and say, God loves this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, as his person, am the salt. I'm not going to take over because too much salt, you spit it out. Right. Too much light, you go blind. <laughs> <laughs> so be God's presence as salt and light and claim that place of your vocation as your calling and his place of abode. And salt and light will do what God wants us to do. Mm, that's beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. Welcome to Canada Day. I'm here at the Royal Canadian Navy War Memorial and we're at the waterfront on Canada Day. And the Bible says in Psalm 72 and 8 that he shall have dominion from sea to sea. We definitely can see how that is relevant here. When we recognize all the history that we have in this land, do you realize that this land has had more revivals than anywhere else in the world? Actually, most revivals have started in Canada and they've gone on to England. The Bible is, is so clear that God does desire to see his people stirred up and fervent for the glory of God. Well, in, in 1784, there was something that happened so powerful. Henry Aline, and all of you from Atlantic Canada, you'll appreciate this. He actually was called the Apostle of PEI and the Apostle of Nova Scotia because he was blazing not only New Brunswick but also the eastern seaboard and planted, and, and get this, and I think this is so powerful as well, he planted so many churches that they called him a burning passion to see souls saved for the kingdom of God. And on his tombstone it said, he was a burning and a shining light and was justly esteemed the Apostle of Nova Scotia. Phoebe Palmer and many others have also come from this land. Well, on this Canada Day, we're saying, God, do it again. We're saying, God, would you from sea to sea, from rivers to the ends of the earth, Lord, would you allow your power to move from Canada and spread throughout the world? I know you're appreciating your barbecue and you're also appreciating your family, but I'm asking you today to continue to pray. Say, God, do it again. Again, he said in Joel, he said, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Old men will dream dreams. Young men will see visions. On my maid servants and male servants, they shall prophesy. Prophesy, Jesus is Lord. Laura Lynn, what do you love so much about Canada, especially on this Canada Day? You know, on a day like today, I love that you can get together with your family and you can barbecue and you can look at the mountains. You can drive to the ocean. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can't, Brian, depending that you might not be in the best part of the country or anything, but I love that Canada is beautiful. Pray for her. I love good people. Mm. I love working with you in Canada. Praise I love God. doing this show. You know what I love about Canada? Mm. I love the, uh, the people of Canada. I mean, there are more people of diversity on this mm. 
space of, of land than any other place in yeah. the entire world. I've traveled all over the world and globally and we're doing great work in, in India and Africa and a lot of different places, but there's no place like home. I feel like kicking my heels like Dorothy. <laughs> But there's no little red shoes here, so, you know, <laughs> omit that. Thank but I, I do love the people, too, and, and I love the food. I think the, you know, oh. you, can, you can eat the mussels in PEI. You can eat potatoes in New Brunswick. You can eat roti in Toronto. Yeah. Some of you are like, what is roti? A little mm. jerk chicken. And then you can go all the way to Klondike Days, and you could have Potato some. Potato chips. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Potato chips. You have anywhere to, in Canada. You know, Canada. you just, you just, my Canada Day, I don't know. You can get it anywhere. Yeah. Barbecue. Mm. That's what you love. All time best barbecue. <laughs> All time every day. The, the, the amount of times this man wants to talk about barbecue. Yeah. <laughs> Just any opportunity to come up with barbecue. Send yeah. me some barbecue recipes. Put the recipe too. up. Yeah. Your favorite yeah. recipe. That's yeah. what we got to put or on the website. Just send me the care package. <laughs> My God, I'm self soliciting. Now, I told you I love the people. <laughs> uh, you know what? God is uh, God is very kind to us to yeah, put us in such a great country. He is. Right? It's one of the best places on earth. So celebrate with your family and want to, you know, doing everything that you love to do. One of the best things about living in Canada is the freedom we have to believe what we want and practice what we believe. For those of us who love, serve, and follow Jesus, that freedom is something we often take for granted. Help us keep using that freedom wisely by spreading the good news about Jesus to as many of our fellow Canadians as we can. For only $20 a month, you can become one of our partners on this great gospel mission. And with Pledge Express, all you have to do is set it up, then let the ministry happen. Make sure to ask for Pledge Express when you call. Mm -hmm. As part of your monthly partnership, you can expect to receive a monthly teaching from Pat or Gordon Robertson designed to help you live free because that's what Jesus came to achieve. Mm -hmm. And to our new monthly partners, we would love to send you this amazing DVD, Living Under God's Blessings, where Pat and Gordon Robertson bring you real-world demonstrations of God's blessings for Israel and important principles for living under the covenant of God's great favor. So call now, one 855 We really appreciate your partnership. Did I say how much I enjoyed barbecue? Yeah. Yeah. Many times. <laughs> On this Canada Day, you know, I think that uh, we need I, to actually go outside and barbecue right now. When am now. I coming for a barbecue at your house? Well, you know what? That's a good, that's a good, I, I'll have barbecue chips. How's that? Um, <laughs> I will take it. You know, she, I'd you, like to come like for the barbecue. Like a deer cut in the headlights of a truck. Yeah, Anytime. let your wife know. Absolutely. Orland's showing up it's sometime done. here. You bring the potato salad. I don't <laughs> trust you with the meat. Okay. Hey, until next time, I'm Brian <laughs> Warren. Know. <laughs> and I'm Laurel and Tyler Dawson. Happy Canada Day. God bless. To contact us, mail Christian Broadcasting Associates Incorporate, the 700 Club Canada, P.O. Box 700, Scarborough, Ontario, M1S 4T4.